they know he's coming who isn't here yet. Yes. Well, grace and peace to you, and welcome to this place, to this holy ground. My name's Ruth Richards and I'm Doug Anderson's daughter. And as I'm also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ in the United States of America, it is uh, my joy, um, my honor, and also my sorrow to officiate at my father's memorial service today. There really is nothing like keeping it in the family, is there? And you are all, all of you, part of dad's family, his relatives, and his friends, uh, you're all his community. And community was really important to my dad. Thank you all so much for coming. You're very welcome. We then are gathered here as God's people, conscious of others who have died and of the frailty of our own existence here on earth. We're gathered here to mourn the death and give thanks to God for the life of Douglas Anderson and share all that he meant to us. And we're gathered here to commend his life to God as we celebrate the good news of the resurrection. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Jesus Christ, who is Lord of both the dead and the living. Come, let us worship. Hear now these promises of Jesus that comfort us and give us hope, even in our loss. I am the resurrection and the life. All who believe in me, though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. 
Let us pray the opening prayer together. Oh God, our Maker, you are everlasting, yet in your company we creatures of day live, move, and have our being. Here we acknowledge that while life may be random, it is not futile. You have made us for a future which we, limited by flesh and blood, cannot imagine. Yet in Jesus, who brought eternity into touch with time, we see glimpses of the greater life for which we hope and into which others have entered. Surround us here with a deep sense of your compassion for us and your love for the and all those who we no longer can touch. Assure us that they are in good company. And we, in this holy place, are in good hands. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing two hymns in this service, and they were both picked out by my dad quite some years ago, but uh, he really was an advanced planner. <laughs> and, and please stay seated. Um, don't, don't jump up and down. troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many dwellings. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also know where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how come we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Now, I'd like to invite Sarah Douglas up to come and uh, tell us her and her sister Kate's um, recollections of, of my dad. And um, they, Sarah and Kate are, are his great nieces. Ever since the passing of our great auntie Hilda and our mum Leslie some 20 years ago, Uncle Doug was a regular and very welcome guest to our Christmas Day gatherings. We would all get together at one of our houses with husbands, granddads, four children and sometimes our in-laws for a very jolly and festive day. Uncle Doug always arrived smartly dressed in a jacket and tie bearing gifts of Christmas bottles of wine and chocolates. He was very good at get along, getting along with everybody. He coped very well in the early days when our children were very small, not being phased one bit by the noise and commotion going on around his feet. Uncle Doug was very well known for his love of a pre-lunch gin and tonic, and we always made sure that his tipple of choice was available. Uncle Doug had an amazing appetite and was always very gracious about our cooking. After lunch, we would have some presents and invariably the children would get something that needed to be constructed or put together. This is where Uncle Doug, along with our dad Bernard, came into their own. Being retired engineers, they would gladly take on the challenge. Together they would pour over the instructions with mini screwdrivers in hand long after the children had lost interest. <laughs> of course, they were always successful in their builds. Even if they had, in the end, resorted to ignoring the instructions because the writing was too small. <laughs> in later years, when the children were older, we all enjoyed playing card games around the Christmas table at tea time. Uncle Doug turned out to be a great card player and always participated enthusiastically with the various games we played together. When Uncle Doug reluctantly gave up his car, he would still come at Christmas and we would make arrangements to go and pick him up from Dean's Mill Court. When driving him home, we enjoyed chatting with him about our family history and about his memories of the past. It was always a pleasure to have Uncle Doug with us at Christmas and it became a lovely tradition. It wouldn't have been Christmas without him. In recent years, we had also started to see Uncle Doug on or around his birthday. And to celebrate, we sometimes took him to his favorite pub, the Fordwich Arms, for lunch, where he would enjoy reminiscing about going there with Auntie Jean back in the day. Uncle Doug and our, our dad shared a passion for engineering, motorcycles and vintage cars. They could often be found in deck chairs at our local car show next to Dad's latest car project. Sometimes when the children were young, we would all go along and join them for a picnic in the sun. We have so many happy memories of Uncle Doug over the years. He was a really kind and gentle man. He had a lovely sense of humour and never took himself too seriously. He was very down to earth and he continued to surprise us with his ability to adapt and embrace new technology. We are so glad that Uncle Doug was able to enjoy good health throughout his long life and that he remained fully independent into old age. He was a much loved and appreciated member of our family and we miss him very much. Now I'd like to invite Albert uh, from Dean's Mill Court to come and share uh, his and um, maybe many of, of your recollections of, um, of my dad. Um, you, you knew him for what, 10 years? Um, oh, a bit longer. Longer than, longer than 10 years, all right. I first met Doug 14 years ago uh, as a coffee morning. Uh, <clears throat> these coffee mornings were a very important bit of Doug's life. Twice weekly, Tuesdays and Friday, Doug was in charge, very much so. 
he would come down early here, open up the kitchen area, get everything ready, and be sure that there was plenty of coffee, milk, biscuits, and so on. And also, he collected a small contribution from all the regulars, rather politely, I thought, to cover his costs. <clears throat> During these coffee mornings, I came to know Doug quite well, and it was the start of my friendship there. He was, I found, remarkably kind and gentle and friendly to other residents, helpful. Also, he was extremely interesting to talk to, and I very quickly developed a friendship with him, and we had long conversations. Often we would stay on after the coffee meeting to chat. <coughs> he, as you know, he soon <coughs> became uh, the treasurer of the Residents Association, which he was for many years. And during this time, I worked very carefully with him. He was a great support to me, always helpful, and I treasured his advice. When his health began to fail and prevented him coming to the coffee mornings, I continued to visit him on a regular basis in his flat. We, are, we had very interesting conversations. <clears throat> His sharp intelligence was often challenging for me, which I quite enjoyed. But he did have, however, a, a stubborn streak <laughs> in his head, which some of you may have encountered. Uh, and once he, his mind was set on a certain path, it became very difficult to shift him off it. Uh, when, after Bernard arrived, we started meeting regularly on a Thursday evening <coughs> for a gin and tonic session. <laughs> now these became quite important. Uh, Doug was not supposed to be a great drinker, but he kept up very well <laughs> with Bernard and me <laughs> during those Thursday evenings, often with hilarious results. Uh, we only hope that the noise we made didn't disturb our neighbours too much. <clears throat> um, during these times, Katrina was a very special help to Doug. She started as a cleaner many years ago, but became far more than that. And I would like to pay tribute to, to Katrina because she was such a help to Doug in his later years. <clears throat> and she devoted a tremendous amount of care and attention to him and he became increasingly reliant on her during those difficult times. Um, it became clear that Doug would have to move into a care home. Typically he resisted this for as long as he possibly could. But in the end, of course, as we know, he had to move. It was a very sad day when he finally had to leave Deesmill Court. He was greatly valued in this community for many years. I personally have greatly appreciated my friendship with him and I shall always remember with great affection these years which I spent with him. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. A reading from
from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather them together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord. I was thinking about my father, Doug, as he was known for much of his long life and trying to find ways of telling some of his long story. Originally, I, I called this, this, this time in our service, Doug's story, but I was thinking afterwards, maybe since we are in Canterbury, where he lived since 1959, um, maybe a better title would be The Engineer's Tale. <laughs> Doug certainly knew many seasons, both of the changing year and the seasons of life. How would we describe him, I wonder? Here are some words that came to my mind. Methodical thoughtful, quiet, and sociable, funny, he had a wonderful sense of humour, careful, an advanced planner, loyal, loving, but not demonstrative. He had a good head for figures. I understand he got this from his father, who was particularly good at mental arithmetic. Dad was slow moving. One of the reasons he never seemed to show his age was because even when he was considerably younger, he never moved fast. <laughs> At least on foot. As he got older, he didn't slow down much. He just carried on at more or less his usual pace. <laughs> and he was just there, quietly getting on with things. And above all else, these two things, I think. He was a gentleman and he was an engineer. If you don't know this already, for a true engineer, it's more than a job, more than a way of earning a living. It's really, it's an orientation. While it's possible to take the man away from engineering, you really can't take the engineering out of the man. Engineers are the people who make things that work, and that's what dad did. A time to be born. Dad was born in 1922 in Cheshire, Hertfordshire. He was a few years older than the Queen, and his lifespan overlapped with the reigns of four British monarchs, George V, Edward VIII, George VI, and mostly Elizabeth II. He was the youngest of three brothers. Colin, the eldest, was 13 years older than Dad. Ken, the middle one, only two years older. Their father, Henry, was a barrel maker. And that's rifle barrels, by the way, not beer barrels. <laughs> Although for years I thought it was beer barrels. <laughs> Their mother, Ethel, was in domestic service before she married. She was actually employed by her uncle James as a housemaid. Dad had far more in common with his older brother, Colin although the age difference meant they had little to do with each other when Dad was a child. But he inherited Colin, Colin's Meccano set and built engine chassis with it, mostly. He also had a train set, and when he was seven, a bicycle. Ken, on the other hand, liked sports. He was on the school cricket and, cricket and football teams. Dad felt playing or watching sports was a bit of a waste of time but he said he was tolerant and understood that people like different things. 
Later on, he liked following motorbike and Formula One racing and introduced his nephew, Kenneth, to both of these delights. He enjoyed making things, things that worked. A time for war and a time for peace. Dad remained single, living with his parents until he was in his 30s. He had deep roots in the outer London suburb of Erith, where his family had moved when he was quite little. When he was 16, he started an engineering apprenticeship at the General Electric Company's factory in Erith. As it happened, the factory made equipment for aircraft carriers and submarine doors. And as this factory was essential to the war effort, when the Second World War broke out a few months into his apprenticeship, he was not called up, being in a reserved occupation. He and his family, though, experienced the Blitz and spent many nights in the bomb shelter at the, at the bottom of the garden when the air raids were on. He said it was a terrible time, but also it was surprising what you got used to. At some point, probably later on in his apprenticeship, he bought his first motorcycle and everything changed. He made good friends. Several other young apprentices were also keen motorcyclists. Petrol was strictly rationed, of course, so actually riding them very far was a bit limited, but they enjoyed hanging out together outside of work, tuning up the bikes, taking them to pieces. Dad's friendships from this time were to last all of their lives. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. The other apprentices had various girlfriends who rode pillion, and over the next few years, they all married. The wives all got on well too, and the friendships thrived. Dad, however, found women something of a mystery. And although he had the occasional pillion passenger, none of them really took. The upside was that as he wasn't spending his wages taking girls out, at one time, he owned three motorbikes, <laughs> all at the same time. The favorite was his Scott. Um, bear with me here, Scott Squirrel. Am I getting this right, Bernard? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. his Scott Squirrel. And it's important to know that the Scott was a 600cc water-cooled twin two-stroke, <laughs> built in 1935 and gave a very smooth ride. And that's his description. After the war ended, his apprenticeship complete, he moved from GEC to his dream job, working in the design office of Associated Motorcycles, met designing racing bikes. Couldn't get any better, really. Or could it? After he'd been there for a while, the chief design engineer hired a new assistant. Her name was Jean Reed. She was a year younger than dad, bright, energetic, witty, a very caring person, easy to talk to, and single. Dad was intrigued. I don't know how long it took for them to transition from work colleagues to being a couple, but theirs was not a whirlwind romance. Maybe it was Dad being slow and methodical. <laughs> Maybe in their thirties they were just rather used to being single, but they married at last in 1957. And I was born just over a year later, their only child. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. By this time, the British motorcycle industry was being outclassed by first Italy and then Japan. And Dad had returned to GEC to work on nuclear power stations, a whole new industry. After I was born, he was promoted to head up the design team to work on the machinery for replacing nuclear fuel rods in a power station to be built in Tokaimura, Japan. This project was to be the most interesting and challenging of his career, he told me. And it gave him the opportunity to travel to both Germany, where some of the manufacturing was done, and also to Japan. It also brought us to Canterbury, where the regular office had been moved. So, with all their family and friends in the southeast London area, my parents moved away from their roots 
to a three-bed semi-detached house in Highfield Close, at the top of St Thomas's Hill on the Whitstable Road. This was when I was about a year old. It had a large garden, and while Dad really wasn't fond of gardening, Mum was. He stuck to mowing the lawn with a motor mower and left the actual planning and planting to her. Although I remember a large part of Saturday was devoted to maintaining the car, usually sort of lying underneath it, doing whatever it is you do when you're underneath a car. <clears throat> I think Dad was as baffled by babies and very small children as he was by women. But as I grew older, I remember learning all sorts of things from him. He was a competent DIYer, all hand tools then, and I remember him building cupboards and shelves in the house and rebuilding the kitchen. I was his chief assistant, and I remember rigging up a little pulley system to pass nails to him when he needed them, although it would have been much quicker just to hand them up to him when he was on the stepladder. But he was patient with this. He taught me to play board games and a few card games, and he let me read to him when I got fluent in reading aloud. And I also learned from him that although a stopped clock is right twice a day, if you take it to pieces and clean it and oil it and put it back together again, it often works. I think that's true for other things too. When I went to the Simon Langton Grammar School for Girls, he helped me learn maths and to use a slide rule and log tables necessary for passing the O-level. I was struggling a bit with that subject. Thanks to him, I gained confidence and took science subjects, including maths, at A-level. I didn't follow him into engineering, but I got a place at Oxford to study chemistry. Both my parents were so proud. It was there that I met John, my husband-to-be, in the chemistry laboratory. Dad and Mum welcomed him into the family, and John's father is also, was also an engineer. And Dad walked me up the aisle at St Mary Bredon's Church when John and I were married nearly 40 years ago. A time to weep. Now in his 60s, Dad taught me the importance of continuing to learn other things. When my mother became ill with a debilitating neuromuscular disease, not long after John and I were married, Dad taught me that sometimes you just have to get on with whatever is put in front of you. All his life, he had been used to his home being run by either his mother or my mother, but quite suddenly, she became too ill to be able to do it. So he learned to cook and do the grocery shopping and the laundry. However, trying to care for her, juggle his work, many doctor's appointments and hospital stays, and all the while watching her strength and vitality drain away, turning her into a helpless invalid before too long. All of this was a terrible strain. And sadly, I think it was something of a relief, relief when she died about two years later. A time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. Just before I went to university, Dad had moved on from GEC to Babcock Wire Equipment in Ashford, working on another new machine, a process for producing first wire and later tubing from scrap metals using a continuous cold extrusion process. Um, the machine was known as Conform, short for continuous form. Am I getting this right, Babcock gentlemen? Yes. <laughs> yes. He liked the work, and he liked the people he worked with. In fact, he liked it all so much that he continued to work there until he was 80. But at first, there he was, fairly recently widowed, and in a rapidly changing work environment with new skills needed, especially the use of computers, which were becoming essential in his workplace. And although he wasn't far off what would be the regular retiring age, he adapted. He took courses to master Excel spreadsheets for doing calculations. He learned how to use the word processing function, although he wasn't quite so excited about that. And he even accepted CAD, Computer Aided Design. He was proud of his computer skills. He had a desktop computer of his own at home, and even quite recently got himself an iPad, 
once Albert showed him how useful they were. <laughs> and it was on this that we were able to talk from across the Atlantic and five hours time difference away. Dad appreciated good things in moderation. At least so I thought up until I heard <laughs> Albert. <laughs> A glass of wine with dinner at the weekend, for example, and the occasional gin and tonic. He also loved going out for meals and he, and he loved warm summer weather, which you don't get much of here, but we do in Massachusetts. And when John and I and our two young sons moved to the USA, he flew out several times to relax in the summer sunshine and play with his grandsons, James and David. He took other opportunities to travel to some other countries, holidaying with friends and with his brother and sister-in-law. He enjoyed music, especially opera, something he came to later in life, and went regularly to concerts at St. Peter's Methodist Church. As he aged, he had the gift of being content with his life, and I watched him exercise the art of aging gracefully and planning ahead. After he retired at last, he started looking out for somewhere more suitable to live, deciding it was time to leave Highfield Close when he had some minor surgery. I came over from Massachusetts for a few days to visit him once he was back home again. While I was here, he received details of a flat in Dean's Mill Court retirement community. We went to see it together. Number seven. I thought it was ideal. Dad needed to think some more. We got home and the next thing I found him drawing out the plan of the flat on a sheet of square paper and then he cut out representations of some of his furniture, all to scale, to work out if it would fit. It did. And so did he. Moving here was one of the best choices he made, especially in later life. The only thing he really missed was his garden shed. This was when he was about 81. Although still a perfectly competent driver, he stopped driving when he was 90 and sold his car. I couldn't imagine him without a car and wondered what he would do. But he had it all thought out, of course. I got myself some new wheels, he announced on acquiring his little electric scooter. <laughs> and he trundled happily around Canterbury on it with no particular desire then to go further afield. He adapted to whatever situation he was in and did whatever was in front of him thoroughly and well. As Albert said, he was the organizer for the Dean's Mill Coffee Mornings for years and served as treasurer on the Residents Association Committee also for years, enjoying the company and the purpose. In fact, his last project for the Association Committee was the creation of a spreadsheet program on Excel to calculate long-term building maintenance costs. When the pandemic struck, he adapted to that too, honing his online shopping skills and got his Sainsbury's order of groceries delivered using the internet. And a time to die. Last year, Dad started planning to leave Dean's Mill Court, realising he was approaching the point where he could no longer live independently. He started sorting out his possessions and with quite a lot of help from Katrina, he got the family history packed up and shipped over to me in Massachusetts. A lot of photographs, some books and pictures and most precious to him, I think, the mantelpiece clock that originally belonged to his great uncle James and is now in the home of my son, another James. Also with Katrina's help, he checked out some nursing homes and eventually moved to Littlebourne House at the beginning of December. And with that job complete, dad's time finished too, more or less according to his plan. We began with Jesus' words about there being many dwellings in his father's house and that he goes to prepare a place for us. But I think for dad to be at home in God's house, there will also need to be a garden shed and even in that perfect place, something that needs fixing in glorious company. We gather together as families and friends to deal with every part of life 
We gather together to celebrate births, make and witness marriage vows, mark milestones like birthdays and graduations and becoming parents. And we gather to support each other in life's trials, fears and sorrows, and when life comes to its end. We are here now to remind each other of who God is and what only God can do. Our bodies will fail and die in time, but our own selves, the essence, the really real part of us, that will be changed and healed and perfected because of Jesus' own undying love and resurrected life. Doug was a great doer. He was practical, sensible, and down to earth. He was many things to many people over his life that spanned almost a century. He was son, brother, brother-in-law, uncle, great uncle, father, father-in-law, husband, grandfather, great-grandfather, a friend to many, and a colleague. He was a gentleman and a gentle man. He liked and respected people, and people liked and respected him. He liked making things work properly, and he liked making and keeping friends. And while I don't know whether he thought much about God, I believe that God knows him very well and loves him dearly, because God also takes seriously this work of mending and healing and keeping. In the end, it's not what we do and achieve in our lives that matters. In the end, it is what Jesus does and achieves for us that is important. He is truly God, yet shared our lives, our frailty, our mortality. He showed us what a life filled with God's love and compassion looked like. He offered us God's hospitality and finally died himself because of human sinfulness. And then in some way that we cannot understand, Jesus overcame death itself and showed us God's acceptance and forgiveness. The Apostle Paul wrote to the early Christians in Rome, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the power and love of God, no part of life, including death because Jesus became one of us, choosing to suffer death himself, even death on a cross. And Jesus accompanies us through every part of life, including death and beyond. And as dad passed peacefully away, and it was peaceful, I'm fully convinced that he has passed into the love of God. So even as we mourn and comfort each other at the ending of Doug's life here, we have confidence that death has most surely united him with this unending love. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength of those who live. You are the strength of those who die. We thank you that you alone are the giver of life and conqueror of death. With faith in your great mercy and wisdom, we may entrust God to your eternal care. We thank you for your steadfast love for him for all the days of his life. We thank you for all that he was and is to those who knew him and loved him. We thank you that the weakness and limitations of old age are now ended for him. Death itself is past, and he has entered the home where all your beloved ones gather and in peace. And this is how it works, O God, on the day when there will be no more death or poverty, when all shall be well. May it be on the first to welcome us to eternal life. Help us to trust, 
fill us with hope. But even our last to the Lord, for the glory of your holy name. Amen. And let us pray together the Lord's Prayer, taught to us by Jesus himself. Some of us know different variations of this. Some of us maybe don't know it at all. So sinners, trespassers, debtors, that we variously are, please feel free to use whatever version you know best or the one in the order of service. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your way will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the glory, and the glory, and the glory, and the glory, and the glory. Gracious and holy God, by your mighty power you gave us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Jesus Christ. We now entrust our dear Doug to your merciful care. We do this in the faith of Christ Jesus, who died and rose again to save us, and who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God, to Jesus the Son of God, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Remember this, my dear ones, that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Remember also this, we are deeply loved and to love we shall return. Hear these words of blessing. Now may you go in peace, and may the God of peace make you complete in all that is good. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look on you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Let me just have one little piece of music to end with. Thank <laughs> you.